Hello, and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and resources to be a better cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I'm your host for today, and I'm privileged to have Jim Lawler as a special guest. If this is your first time listening, thank you for choosing us to help you with your journey and your cybersecurity skills to get to an executive level. And if you're a longtime listener, thank you for supporting us as we help improve your process and technology and people skills to ensure all of the information that we're responsible for protecting. As I mentioned, we've got Jim Lawler. Now, Jim is somebody that we think you're really going to enjoy listening to. Jim's an insider threat expert, and he has served more than 25 years at CIA as an operations officer in various international posts and as the chief of the Counter Proliferations Division Special Activities Unit. Exactly what that is? Well, we'll have to ask him. But he's a specialist in the recruitment of foreign spies. And he spent well over half his CIA career battling the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Now, long story short, he's the type of guy that the CIA would call on to, well, recruit foreign agents. And he tried to convince people who his own government might say, if you're caught spying, we'll kill you. And yet he is able to influence them to say, hey, we think that what you're offering us is a better deal than what we would have living in our current environment. So I think you'd enjoy listening to him and learning from him to understand how insiders are recruited. And so what you can do potentially to prevent this from happening to your company, not necessarily at a national level, but maybe at the competitive level or the likes. Before we get going, though, a quick word from our sponsor. Risk 360 is a cybersecurity technology and consulting firm that works with high growth technology firms to help leaders build, manage, and certify security, privacy, and compliance programs. They publish weekly thought leadership, webinars, and downloadable resources like budget and assessment templates. Learn more at risk360.com slant resources. That's R-I-S-K-3-S-I-X-T-Y.com slant resources. Okay, enough with the commercial, and thank you to our sponsor again. But Jim, thanks for taking the time to come visit us at, at CISO Tradecraft. And as I said, I could spend a long time. I've read your bio, looked at your background, but please, I'd love to hear it in your words. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you very much for inviting me on the program. I'm excited about this because uh, recruiting insiders has been a passion of mine since I joined the CIA in 1980. Now, I backed into this career Really by accident, I was in my last year of law school at the University of Texas way back in the uh, year of our Lord, 1976. And like any third-year law student or person in their last year of graduate school, I was only interested in one thing, and that was finding a job. And so I was going to a lot of interviews with various law firms, and lo and behold, CIA came to campus, and they were looking for attorneys for the Office of General Counsel at CIA. Like any large government bureaucracy or any large organization, we need attorneys to either keep us out of trouble or get us out of trouble. And of course, the CIA is frequently in trouble. And so I had an interview with a gentleman named Mr. Bill Wood, who was a CIA case officer. Now, I didn't know what that meant, but he was there interviewing for attorneys. We got about two minutes into the conversation. And he looked at me and he said, Jim, have you ever thought about the clandestine service? And I said, uh, no, I'm not even sure what that is. That was 1976. CIA did not even have a sign out on Route 123 saying it was a Central Intelligence Agency. It was Fire yeah. Federal Highway Administration or something like and that. And actually, there is an office of the Federal Highway Administration <laughs> back there. But it, the, you know, it was not indicated that CIA was there. So uh, Mr. Wood said, well, Jim, I can't tell you much about the clandestine service, but I think you'd be good at this. And so I, I was intrigued by that. Unfortunately, though, at the time, my wife's mother was very ill, and the chances that we would move away from our hometown of Houston, Texas, to Washington, D.C., and then thousands of miles overseas, that was not going to happen. So the next day, with some regret, I returned the uh, application to the gentleman, to Mr. Wood, and said the timing just wasn't right. So instead of going to work for CIA or even going to work for a law firm, I went to work for a family business. I don't know how many of you in the audience have ever been in family businesses, but if you're no longer in a family business, it's probably because it focuses on the family, mm -hmm. on that F word, the family. And... I was making a lot of money, a hell of a lot of money, more money than I would ever make in the rest of my life. 
And I was very unhappy because it was so unfulfilling. It was a basically a machinery and steel component business down in Houston, Texas. And I'd come home at night, every night. And often I would be complaining about how unhappy I was. And my wife listened to this for about three years. And she finally said, Jim, either do something about this or stop your belly aching. So I'd kept Mr. Wood's card. And I went into my office after dinner and I wrote him a letter. This is, I like to say this before Al Gore invented the internet. So I had to write a letter. And I said, we met three and a half years ago. And you offered me a possibility that I couldn't take at the time, but I think the timing's right at the moment. By this time, by the way, my wife's mother had passed away. So we no longer had this, this unbreakable link to Houston. So I wrote this letter, mailed it. It was about three days later, I got a phone call from a young woman and she never used the letters CIA. All she said was, Mr. Wood received your letter a few days ago, and he's very interested in talking to you. If you can meet him next Thursday at 3 p.m. in the lobby of the Holiday Inn on the Gulf Freeway. And so I said, sure. So I showed up. He's there. He takes me into uh, his room, his suite. We chatted for about two hours, and he said he'd like to fly me to Washington. So a couple of weeks later, I flew to Washington for some tests. About three months after that, they invited me to come back for more tests, this time a polygraph test, which some people mistakenly call a lie detector test, but it's not. Uh, it's a stress test. And then uh, a series of psychological questions and interviews and tests. And about two or three months after that, they called me up and they offered me a job as a GS-11 case officer or operations officer. Now, the bizarre thing was I had no idea what that meant or what they wanted me to do, but I was so unhappy. I would have taken a job anywhere doing anything just to get away from Houston, Texas. And so a couple of months later, we packed up the car. We moved to Washington. My wife was pregnant with our first child. And on February 19th, 1980, I started work and I found out exactly what they expected me to do. And I like to be very candid about this. They expected me to exploit people, manipulate people, subvert people, suborn people, convince them to commit treason, to betray a trust. And I found out that not only was I really good at this, but I enjoyed the hell out of it. Oh, so you've got this skill that maybe it's a latent skill. You aren't aware of it. And as a result of this initial interview, with the agency, you're given an opportunity to what go out into the field, I would think. Now, do they, they initially drop you out there or they get you some specialized training for that? And then what was your first year like when you're out there is kind of the new kid on the block? How, how does that work out? Well, they have a lot of training. We do spend, at least in the uh, early years, a lot of training, operational training, training in intelligence tradecraft, training in the region that you're going to be sent to. The language that you will need. They decided I should have French language training. I had some rudimentary Spanish, so that made French language fairly easy, relatively easy. And I was going to be posted to uh, some countries in Europe. So, but I did go through our trade craft training at the, what we call the farm. Euphemistically, we call it the farm for operational training. But if and, you know, I was learned. I learned how to conduct a meeting. I think that's about extent of it and how to run a surveillance detection route to see if I was under surveillance, under enemy surveillance. I uh, learned about how to make a dead drop if I'm trying to communicate with somebody impersonally. But as far as the uh, basic uh, recruitment techniques, I think, honestly, I think a case officer is either born with this skill or not. And it's not something you can enhance it, perhaps you can polish it, you can focus it. But if you don't have this skill to begin with, I don't think the CIA can give it to you. So I think I had at least something that appealed to Mr. Wood. Here he was trying to hire attorneys, and he thinks, you know, this guy would be better as an operations officer since he was one himself. That old saying about it takes one to know one, I think it must have pre prevailed. So after about two and a half years of 
language study and training, and you work on the uh, country desk of the place where you're being sent so that you know what the operational cases are. So then they decided to uh, send me abroad, and we spent the next 12 years uh, abroad, consecutive assignments, five, five consecutive assignments. In fact, they even offered me a sixth tour abroad, but by that time, we'd had two more children. The children had not been any, you know, educated in the United States. We were sending them to French schools so that they would have a foreign language besides English. And, and that was great. And we were enjoying it. But ultimately, after 12 years, we thought we need to come back to the States and let the children learn what it's like to become Americans. I mean, I was having a lot of fun running case officer operations, recruiting foreign sources. I, I, I loved it. Came back and instead I got into some counterproliferation operations uh, back at CIA headquarters. Yeah, and of course I got to keep in mind in the back of my mind you're still an attorney, and so you're out here in the field. and And I'd love to talk more about the CIA time. Maybe we'll get back to that toward the end of the show if we got a little bit of extra time. But what I'd like to do is, is sort of turn the conversation more toward the understanding of insider threats. And so one of the things we look at is because, if you will, you're a natural at being able to identify either vulnerabilities or propensities for somebody to be able to turn, then what are some of the common vulnerabilities that these people might possess that make them easier to recruit? I mean, of course, I'm thinking the obvious ones like, well, they owe a lot of money or got some horrible thing going on in their life they're trying to keep secret, but it may not be as, as ridiculous or as extreme as that. Actually, a good way to illustrate this is with my first recruitment of a uh, clandestine source. Uh, we had received a cable from CIA headquarters that the United States was going to be becoming entering into some very crucial national security negotiations with a certain country in about 18 months. And as it turned out, we had absolutely no sources on the other side who could give us a privileged insight as to what their negotiating positions would be. And so they described, CIA headquarters described, here would be the ideal source. If you can meet somebody from this particular country who has this kind of access, then you need to increase what we call our developmental activities, basically trying to build that trust, that friendship, and seeing what is the stress in this person's life? What are the vulnerabilities that uh, you can identify, that you can use as a handle to make a recruitment pitch. And that's where you come out and you basically break cover. You say, I'm really with the CIA and I would like you to work for me on my team. And here I've got a, you know, an, an honorarium I can pay you monthly. It could be like a, uh, you know, a certain X amount of dollars. Well, I had by serendipity, I had met a man who met this criteria exactly. I'd met him earlier in a ski club, just innocent ski club. And we clicked, he was a nice guy, but suddenly I was focused on the fact that this could be a great recruitment target. So I started increasing our lunches, our dinners, things like that. And after a couple of months, I felt like I had a good handle on this guy. But the bizarre thing was I didn't identify any vulnerabilities. I just thought I could recruit this guy based on the sheer force of my personality and the strength of our friendship. Now, this is naive to the extreme, really naive. But headquarters was so damn desperate, they agreed to my cockamamie recruitment pitch scheme and approved it. You know, you can't just go out and pitch somebody to commit espionage. You have to have headquarters approved. Well, I had that. So I take this guy to dinner and I basically pitched him saying that, you know, if he could help me, get some privileged insights into their negotiating positions. And I was prepared to give him a consulting fee that was really quite nice. And he looked at me and he said, Jim, what you're proposing is morally wrong. I can't do that. You and I are friends, but that's wrong. So I shut up and didn't, didn't force the issue because he turned me down. In fact, I thought if I pursued this anymore, you know, I'm going to upset the guy. Well, we have a saying at CIA that it's okay to be turned down, but not turned in. Meaning, what if this man goes back to his ambassador, his boss? And something I didn't mention was this guy was the number two guy in his embassy. He was basically the deputy chief of mission. 
the number two guy. What if he goes to his boss, the ambassador, and he says, you know, that Mr. Lawler over at the American embassy just propositioned me to become a traitor, to betray our country. And then his boss, who was known for having a very violent temper, could have stormed into our ambassador's office and basically lodged a very strongly worded protest of the outrageous action of Mr. Lawler against his deputy, his own deputy. I mean, how outrageous. So I'm, I'm thinking all of this over the next two or three days. And I thought, okay, I've got to call him up and do some damage control here. I've got to smooth the water here. I've got to make sure that he and I are still friends and maybe somehow uh, tell him that maybe he took my words out of context or maybe I was sadly mistaken and apologize. So I called him up. And the first thing, I was relieved that he didn't hang up in my ear. And I said, uh, I just enjoyed the evening a few days ago. I was wondering if you'd like to go out again this Friday night. Let's have another nice evening together. And I was relieved when he said, well, Jim, you know, I was thinking the same thing. So I thought, okay, great. So I go to this second meeting. This, this is one week after I've pitched this guy to commit es espionage. One week afterwards, I take him to this nice restaurant. The waiter drops the menus off at our table, walks away. And the first words out of this gentleman's mouth, Jim, that offer you made me last Friday, is that still good? And I said, yes, it is. And he says, well, what you don't know is my wife, three days after that, announced that she wants a divorce and I can't afford to go back to my country next year and pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and put my two high school age boys in private schools. Because in my country, if you're not in a private school, you're not going to get a good education. I can't do that unless I take your offer. And I know it's morally wrong. Well, I didn't argue that. In fact, there's a saying in law school that if the judge rules in your favor, shut up and get out of court. So I shut up and, and, I, and by the way, let me, let me interject here. I've probably pitched anywhere from 55 to 60 people in my career. He's the only one that ever posed a moral objection. Normally, if somebody objects, they will do so on basis of fear. I had one African diplomat. He was an African intelligence officer. He said, Jim, you know, they hang people in my country for doing things like that. But then he stunned me by saying, but could I have a rain check? And I went, a rain check? He said, yeah, my son is three years old now and I don't need you. But in 15 years, he'll be university age. I might need you then. So I wrote that down in the file. And 15 years later, when he was posted to the United States, the division came to me and said, he said this way back then. Do you think he meant it? I said, yep, he did. And so we cashed that rain check in 15 years later. But we go back to my friend now. Okay, so he's now under a lot of psychological problems. He's going through a divorce, which is one of the most tumultuous times in anybody's life. And he was needing the money basically to pay his wife the alimony, to pay for his kid's education. But I find out that there was a lot more to this man than just that, those needs. In fact, I would say bluntly that there's never just one thing that causes someone to commit espionage or to betray a trust. In his case, the first time he brought me out a stack at least six inches thick of classified documents, he said to me, Jim, let me tell you something about my boss, the ambassador. I hate that son of a bitch. And as I'm handing you this material, I'm thinking about all the times that he went around stealing credit for what I do and everybody else in the embassy does. And so as I hand you this classified material, it's as if I'm kicking that son of a bitch in the face. So I took the material from my friend and I said, tell you what, we're on the same team now. Bring me some more and let's kick that son of a bitch again. <laughs> and he did. He got into it in a big way a big way, but it was revenge. He felt like that he wasn't the one that was being the traitor. He had been betrayed first because his boss had stolen the credit for all that he was doing. And so he rationalized it easily by saying, I'm just evening the score.
In fact, the Jesuits call that covert compensation. They you know it's that's why that's how somebody can rationalize what they're doing. We later had to polygraph the man because we were sending him back into uh, his home country in a year, and he was going to be handled by one of my colleagues who doesn't have diplomatic protection. I had a black passport, a diplomatic passport. The worst that can happen to me is I get kicked out of a country, persona non grata. Well, if you get one of my deep cover, what we call non-official cover colleagues, if you arrest them, they go to jail and it can be for years. So we had to be doubly sure that this guy was actually legitimate. And so we were going to put him through a uh, three-issue counterintelligence polygraph test. Number one question. Have you told anyone about your secret relationship with CIA? That's pretty easy. Yes or no. Number two, uh, are you working for any intelligence organization other than CIA? Pretty easy. And number three, did someone direct you to volunteer to Mr. Lawler at that second dinner party? That's pretty easy, too. So the polygrapher, the operator, he's not supposed to go straying off on a fishing expedition. He's supposed to stick to those questions unless the subject gives him reason to stray from those. But as luck would have it, I've got this young, naive polygrapher who's never been overseas. And the first question to my friends, the first question was, I'm just curious, why are you doing this? And I thought, oh, don't open the Pandora's box. But my friend laughed. And he said, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. He was a thrill seeker. It was kind of one of these Walter Mitty things. Now I'm a spy and I'm going to be a very good spy. And he went back into his country and he was a very good spy. He told us not only their negotiating positions, but all of their fallback positions. And if you've ever bought a house, how would you like to know the bottom dollar that you could offer a seller before they would walk away? And that's what he did. And it was estimated that he saved the United States on the order of tens of billions of dollars because of that, that transparency that we needed. So I'm telling you that the motivations for espionage are complex. Some of my colleagues try and summarize this using the acronym MICE, M-I-C-E, money, ideology, coercion, or ego. Money is never the sole motivator. Money may satisfy an ego need. Money may satisfy a psychological need, but it's never the sole motivator. Uh, ideology, you get those occasionally. Somebody hates a communist or socialist system and they want to cooperate with us. Uh, coercion is something that we typically don't use. I don't use it and it's not a moral issue. It's because I don't want to be driving down the street with a rattlesnake in my back seat. I would rather have you positively motivated and want to do what I want you to do. I want you to think of new ways to steal intelligence and give them to me. I want you to look forward to our meetings. And of course, the final one, you know, ego. Ego is the big, whether it's revenge, whether it's a slight, you've been passed over. You know, I started targeting, in fact, I know this sounds probably a little bizarre, but I would start targeting human resources people because the human resource people, they know exactly who's the fast track people and who the slow track people are. And guess, guess what? I'm interested in the slow track people. I, I've told my students when I teach human recruitment, I never once recruited a happy person. You don't recruit happy people. You recruit people who are under stress. I used to be a rock climber. When I was living in Switzerland, I'd go out and I'd study the rock for cracks because that's how you climb the rock. You look for places to put your fingers and toes and you look at that crack system and you can't see it from far off. You have to get close to it and study it. And people are just like that. People have crack systems. Everybody is under a certain degree of stress and sometimes it's apparent and sometimes it takes me a long time. In one case, it took me 11 years for me to find the key to the stress in this one target's life. And kind of like my other friend, he was going through a bad divorce. I had been, I had been best man at his wedding. That's how close I'll get to you. If I'm coming after you, I'm coming after you. You and I are going to be best buddies. And so I'd been best man at his wedding. His marriage fell apart after two or three years. And in addition to being psychologically adrift 
because of that marriage, he was posted back to his home country. And in the time he had been gone, his ethnic group was no longer in charge. And so he found out, much to his chagrin, that it didn't matter if he worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, he could never be promoted again because he was no longer in the ruling ethnic group. And he wrote me an email and he said, Jim, he said, this is so frustrating. It is so unfair. How can a people that are treated like this give allegiance to this country? So that's, you know, like, come recruit me. So I, I engineered a meeting to meet him in Europe and broke cover in 30 seconds and told him, you know, I, I think you probably thought I was CIA, but you were polite enough to protect me, for which I'm very grateful. But I'd like you to join my team. He said, you know, I'd love to do that. And a few months later, 9-11 happened. And he said it was almost a counterintelligence issue for him because he was at his foreign ministry and he was watching those twin towers come down and he got very emotional. He was almost weeping and his colleagues noticed and they said, why are you so upset? You're, you're not an American. And he said, well, what they don't know is I'm on your team now. So that's how they, they, they join the new team. It's, no, it's not treachery. They're, they're just part of a new team. They got hired away by a new team. And that's the kind of approach I use going after people. I have a, I have a soft voice. Uh, one of my assets once said, you know, Jim, when you're talking, it's like my brain is in a warm water bed. I'm trying to totally relax them. I'm trying to totally bring down any constraints. I want them to look forward to working with me. Well, that's kind of a fascinating story. I was just sitting here trying to take it all in. And, you know, in kind of my little bit of research here and looking at it, we're thinking of what motivate people and failure to promote money, revenge, thrill of breaking the rules. You mentioned all, all of those things. And so for us as leaders and managers, a lot of what I tell people is one of the most important things you need to do as a leader, more so than a manager, is to know your people. As Absolutely. a manager... You can Absolutely. focus on the numbers, you can get the production done, you can get the deliverables on time, you can bang on the table. But a good leader is going to know a little bit more about what's going on. And Absolutely. to listen, to listen. You can't give your employees everything they want. No, you can't. But if you give them a fair hearing and you don't treat people differently, you know, basically treat people fairly. We used to have an administrative officers at one of my uh, biggest posts overseas. And I went in to try and convince him that we needed a new, I think it was a new dryer in our apartment. This guy was marvelous. He should have been a case officer. He turned me down, and yet I left feeling good about it. <laughs> and he was just so warm. And, oh, Jim, I, I can understand that. I just can't do it right now. But yeah, I'll have you on that list, you know. And, and I, I came out of there just smiling as if I had gotten what I wanted. But he just listened and was fair. He explained it very logically, and he and he, I felt like I'd been treated fairly, and that's that's the thing. We used to have we used to have observation posts maybe on a Russian embassy, and at quitting time, say at five o'clock or five thirty, we'd see three or four Russians piling out of the building, slapping each other on the back, and they're all headed for some bar somewhere. Well, we'd wait, and then we'd see another guy come out a few minutes later, all by himself. Guess guess which one we're interested in. Yeah, he, it's the guy who doesn't feel like he's part of the team, who's who's he, he's not a team player. He's just he just maybe they're picking on him. Maybe he just feels like the odd man out, whatever. My son was a Marine Corps infantryman a number of years ago in Iraq. And yeah, he was fighting for our country, but he was also fighting for his fellow Marines. Yeah. And that's the thing. You, you fight for them. That makes my job so much more difficult. If your employees feel like they're part of the team and being treated fairly. And then I think you've raised uh, so several excellent points there. I mean, for me in my military career, as you found, I said, get to know your people as best you can. Now, my last job, I had 11,000 people. So you, you can't get to know everybody, but you at least work with your direct staff. But more importantly, what you're looking for are people who are either outliers because somehow they don't fit in or they've been excluded. Now, not to say that everybody who fits into that category represents an espionage risk, and particularly in the corporate world, where we're less worried perhaps of national actors than we are about individuals or maybe competitors, or who knows. But I think that when you find somebody who is, you had said, 
unhappy, they're not fitting in, that they don't align with their peer group, and they've been treated unfairly. Those all tend to be indicators that for a good leader should start to say, we need to be careful over here because a lot of times there's a lot of unfairness out there. And when people complain something isn't fair, my response is fair is where you take your kids to eat cotton candy. There <laughs> is no legislated fair out there. It's whatever you make out of it in life. And if you feel something is unfair, change it or fix it or leave it. Right. You can't necessarily change that system. Um, so how would we as leaders then, if we have that as sort of our, our mental template, somebody who may have one of these four different motivators we talked about, either they didn't get their promotion or they motivated by money, they need money, something happened, there's a revenge activity, the thrill of breaking the rules. We find out that they don't fit in with their peer group. And you're absolutely right, as you mentioned about your son, uh, you may join the military to serve your flag and your country, but you risk your life for the guy or the woman next to you because that's where those personal bonds form. And, and so you just almost like a herd, you, you peel off the one week one and you don't eat it, but you, you recruit it and things such as that. But what you've mentioned also is that your means of communication, as you'd said, a nice, quiet, calm voice, somebody almost like a father confessor, you could sit here and, and talk to you for quite a long time. And is that something that, as you had said, you tend to be born with? Is that one of, what are the things the skills that help people perhaps as leaders become better at becoming empathetic and listening to their own people? Well, I have a, a kind of a list of what makes a good recruiter, or basically what makes somebody be very persuasive. And one, the number one thing is, is curiosity. I'm just naturally a curious person. If I hadn't been an operations officer, I think I would have loved to have been a psychologist or a psych, psychiatrist. I just like hearing people talk and what makes everybody tick. Everybody's a little different. They're like snowflakes and everybody's different. And I'm just infinitely curious about that. I think secondly, having a keen listening ability, you don't recruit people when you're in transmit mode. You listen, you listen, you listen, and they will tell you things that then allow you to climb the rock, as, as I was saying, those cracks. Uh, the third thing, extreme empathy. If I want to recruit you, I want to get inside your head. I want to feel your pain. And I want to know how we can address that pain and how I can be basically uh, your answer to how to relieve that. Uh, number four, patience. I told you about in one case where I waited 11 years before I found out the key to recruitment on this one target. Uh, number five, persistence. I recall one of my recruitment pitches of a East Block intelligence officer. He didn't say no, but he didn't say yes. And because I was being transferred a few days later, I did not persist. I didn't go back to him because I know I could have recruited him. And that's one of my few failures of recruitment. Uh, the next one is creativity. We can always use more creativity. You know, it's just think out of the box. Don't think of the school solution. There is no school solution. It, every solution is going to be tailored slightly differently. And the next thing that I think I possess is I am a very careful observer of stressors in people's lives. And in essence, I've become a student of human frailty. That's, that's harsh, but that's basically what I've become because I've, I've got that empathy. I understand what they're going through. The next quality is very harsh. It's called ruthlessness meaning you never forget why you're doing this. You're not just doing this to become their friend. You're doing this for the national security of the United States. If I'm doing this, in fact, I've told my students in recruitment, I said, if you've never had a recruitment pitch turned down, you haven't pitched enough people. And you need to know when you're over the bounds, how to back out of that and things like that. The other thing is, is if you confuse the relationship you have with this person as a friendship and you're afraid of jeopardizing the friendship. You got to get over that. Then having a powerful or persuasive personality, that should be obvious. And the final thing is very spooky. It's what I call the metaphysics of recruitment because the top one or 2% of all recruiters has something that I can't explain and neuroscience can't explain. But when I go into that pitch, I'm so hyper-focused on the individual and the individual on me 
that it's as if I'm putting a mental link, a hook into their brain and reeling them in. And literally, if explosions were going off and fires around us, we wouldn't even notice. We're in a different plane of existence. Now, one of my students, a very talented non-official cover officer, he thought that I was using the techniques developed by Dr. Milton Erickson, who developed hypnotherapy in the 20th century. And there may be some truth to that, but I think it even transcends that to where there's this, this certain quality that neuroscience can explain as to why some people can be extremely persuasive and getting you to do things you would never, ever have dreamed of doing before. I'm sure that of the people I recruited, not a single one ever thought, I'm going to become a trader and work for Jim. No, not right away. They didn't. So that's, that's the kind of thing. Listening, empathy, focus. That's, that's, the, that's what I, I was fortunate enough to have that. And so some of it you can teach, some of it you can enhance, but there are a basic, you know, I, out of the thousands of students I've taught, in the intelligence community, and that's CIA, DIA, FBI, I can think of three who were the best recruiters I've ever met. Two of them were women. One was a, this knock officer, but the other two, one was a DIA case officer. Her name is Shawnee Delaney. She's a wonderful person, and you should have her on this program at some point. And then the other person is a ethnic Korean female FBI special agent. And wow, you talk about focus. She could recruit anybody. And those are the thousands I've seen and witnessed their recruitment pitches. Those are the three best I've ever worked with. And so it, it comes down to a couple of thoughts here. One is, is that for us as leaders in our own organization, if we feel we may be vulnerable to some of this, we almost have a counter espionage role that's probably not defined in our job description, certainly if we're working in the dot-com world. But if we're working as a defense contractor or working in .gov or .mil, as my background, you get a little bit closer to that being a greater and greater threat. One of the things that we're seeing with Department of Defense, with their CMMC and their initiative to go ahead and create a cybersecurity maturity model certification, is the recognition that foreign adversaries don't necessarily go through and break in through the front door and they go ahead and they run away with the, the next model from Northrop Grumman. They'll go through a subcontractor, they'll go through a small supplier, they'll move laterally through the network, they'll, they'll do those attacks. And not only just through the technology side, which we've covered quite a bit over the course of our you know, few years of doing these shows, but more importantly is for our discussion, through the human side. And so you may know your people, but you may not know your contractors or your contract may know who they are, but they don't know their people. And so what we have then is a web of trust, but how do you firewall that such that were somebody to potentially be recruited to an all, another purpose than from which you've employed them, that you would either frustrate those efforts or be able to detect those fairly early on? Well, there's no 100% insurance program out there, but I think you know, observing people, if they're starting to act, their behavior is erratic or aberrant, if they're keeping odd hours, if they're showing unusual interest in things that are not part of their account, uh, these are these are telltale signs. I mean, I guess you could say uh, sudden, sh you know, signs of wealth that they can't explain, uh, things, you know, real yeah. severe problems in their lives, being, being attuned to your employees' needs and employees. Uh, psyche, what what's going on? You know, and dropping around and just chatting with people. I I'm not a great manager, but I know some who are, and they would use what I call helicopter management. They would just go from office to office and just you know have a have a talk with somebody, not about business necessarily, but maybe how's the family life, what's going on, making sure that people are under you know that they're doing okay, uh, keeping them if if at least being treated fairly, like I said, that their boss is fair. You're less likely to betray somebody like that. But then again, you know, if you suddenly notice that your competitors have got, they seem to have the mark, they've stolen a march on you and they now know your strategy or they know your customers. Well, you can be darn sure that there's somebody inside because it really doesn't matter what kind of cyber moat you have. If somebody inside lowers the drawbridge, you know, right. I've got somebody inside. That's the game changer. 
you know, you can have all the so-called technical cyber defenses in the world. And that's like a cyber Maginot line. It gives you great comfort and you're, they're going right through that because they don't even, they're not even, they're not even using cyber. They're maybe using a thumb drive. They're doing something else to steal stuff or just listening to what's going on and being a perfect spy. And I think that's some very, very excellent advice there because a lot of times we get all enamored with the technology and we, we look at our technical budgets and the interlocking layers of security that we put in only to find out that basically, as you had said, like imagine a line, someone just went around through Belgium and went around the corner. Right. Americans, Americans are like magpies. They get fascinated by shiny objects or by technology. <laughs> At, you know, the Russians, the Russians had our Manhattan Project penetrated at every level and they had redundancy. It was amazing what the NKVD, the predecessor of the KGB, what they mm -hmm. did. Every part, they had the whole plans for everything. In fact, when the Russians detonated their nuclear weapon, they based it on our plan because they knew our plan worked. Our design worked. And Berea, who was head of the NKVD intelligence, he said, we're going to use the plan that works or it'll be my head and your head. So they actually detonated their first nuclear weapon based on the American design, even though they had indigenous designs and all of their designers were kind of miffed that they didn't use the indigenous design. He said, I know this one works. We've stolen it. You've written some books on this subject. And so if somebody says, hey, I'm this Jim Lawler's fascinating individual. Have you written nonfiction, fiction, a little bit of both? Where would someone go to learn more about your thinking? Well, my first book, they're fiction, but they're thinly disguised fiction of things that actually happened in my career. The first book is called Living Lies, and it's about uh, how we penetrate the Iranian nuclear weapons program. And in the book, I describe a systems administrator for a cloud company, a cloud computing company. He's a former CIA officer who's trusted, you know, he's been through his polygraph and, and regardless of whether you think polygraphs are lie detectors or not, they are only an indicator frozen in time. Somebody can be, as I told you earlier, not recruitable. And a week later, they're recruitable because something climactic, you know, happened, something catastrophic in their lives. Well, in this guy's case, he's going through a terrible divorce. His boss mistreats him, and he suddenly falls in love with this beautiful young Iranian woman. And she, over the next several months, manipulates him psychologically, sexually, and everything else, and gets him basically to take a thumb drive and put it in the cloud computing company's uh, system, which then basically drops the shields. And suddenly, the Russian intelligence and Iranian intelligence can read everything on there. And so it was a classic, basically a honey trap operation building on this guy's ego. And then, you know, she manipulates him and, and they get inside our classified holdings by recruiting the systems administrator. I mean, he's the key to the kingdom right there. He's the guy, he's got, he's got super user privileges. He's got all these things and he is the key target. He's been basically complaining on Facebook about things. And so people notice, you know, they, they read these Facebook accounts, these social media accounts. And it, it's scary what people will tell you, tell you about themselves, about how vulnerable they are. And so the uh, Iranians and the Russians play this guy like a fine violin. And so that's Living Lies. The second one is called In the Twinkling of an Eye. And that's about a Russian-North Korean conspiracy to develop a very devastating genetic bioweapon. And uh, there's a ample amounts of artificial intelligence in there, as well as uh, exploration, these very nasty bioweapons. And did uh, that serve as a basis for any type of script for a recent James Bond movie? I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, I have a couple of companies that are pursuing separately both books for either a movie or a streaming series. And that would be pretty. Yeah, I had a guest on our show, a dear friend of mine, Richard Thiem. I don't know if you ever had a chance to run into him, but if not, I'll provide an introduction uh, after the show. Richard uh, is a fascinating fellow, and he's, he wrote his first book at, in his 60s, and he's now got, he's working on his, his 12th book now. Mm. And what he found out is that he had sort of adopted both the hacker community as well as the intelligence community, and he found out that the only way to tell the truth about what really happens is to write it in fiction. Actually, that's, that's, that's very telling that you say that I can be, 
much more liberated. I, everything I write, by the way, still has to go to CIA right. for review. They took a year to review the first one. And in the end, they had five redactions they wanted or demanded. I have a right to appeal them. But since the uh, redactions themselves were just a few words here and there and they didn't affect the storyline, I just thought to heck with it. And so I did away. And then the second book, they only took a month to review it with no redactions required and even a request for the CIA library <laughs> copy. But I'm working on my third one, which is more about pure treachery in the human heart. A little bit about the traitors and what they're going to be doing. Yeah. This sounds fascinating. So again, a lot of things I was kind of hoping to get to, like any other conversation, we're kind of closing in on our time here. But what I wanted to summarize then potentially is this. If one of our listeners says, yeah, we probably need a good counter espionage program. At least I need to learn to know my people better. And to, they need to go to their boss and say, I need to do some of it thing to along these lines, but their boss doesn't get it because they haven't listened to you. How would they convince their management that there is a genuine return on investment for doing this correctly, for managing your people well and being able to detect when they start to stray before they get too far out? Well, I was a consultant at the Department of Energy's and Office of Intelligence and Counterintelligence for seven years. And we were looking at this very closely. And one thing we came up with is you need to make a list of what your crown jewels are. What are the things that would keep you up at night or give you a heart attack if you knew that your competitors or some other, you know, basically some outsider had this? If they had this, what is the thing that's going to be, that's going to be the, the, the hit below the waterline, you know, the thing that's going to sink your company? And I think if you narrow it down to a few of those key elements, the crown jewels, and then who has access to the crown jewels and, and in kind of work out from there. So I think that's the thing, uh, you know, having a, a very robust, what we used to call at the agency, a family liaison office, basically an office where you could go. And if you had a problem, a personal problem, or whatever kind of problem, you could go and talk to somebody and they'd listen to you and try and find you some help. It could be that you've got a drinking problem or a drug problem, or you have an elder care issue. Think of the aging of America and the people that have elder care issues, or you have a spouse that's got a problem. So that if the spouse has a problem, you've got a problem. So to talk you through this and help you try and find some assistance in uh, controlling that or in treating you fairly. I mean, maybe somebody's got a gambling problem. Oh. You wouldn't believe the number of foreign intelligence officers we've recruited because they basically took some of their money that had been entrusted to them and lost it at, uh, either at the casino or something. And suddenly they were in big trouble. And that's why they, they came to us to volunteer. So, you know, being, a, being alert to your employees, you know, somebody's acting differently these days, knowing your employees and, and having people because if you lose a key element of that, it can cost you not millions, but billions of dollars. Can you imagine? I mean, a, a pharmaceutical company. We we did a, uh, a, about a year or so ago, we did this for Abbott Laboratories. And they spend billions of dollars on research and development. And if that stuff gets stolen, that just goes out the window. And huh, it's it's wasted. You know, their competitors get that or a foreign country gets it. You know, that, that would be a real hit below the waterline. And as, as a Navy captain, I could relate to that analogy. But, but Jim, this has been absolutely fascinating. I want to thank you for the gift of your time about describing about your work. And again, thank you for your service on behalf of the United States, but also how spies are recruited, how individuals are turned, what makes them vulnerable to being turned what managers and executives can and should know about their people to help them better understand who's at risk and the types of programs that they can put into place, as well as the personal characteristics about being able to minimize that risk by getting to know your people better and being sensitive to what might happen to go wrong. So for our listeners, thank you very much for being a part of our audience today. And please share our show with your friends on either LinkedIn or other social media. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the little subscribe button. We're trying to get our numbers up. There's a good reason for that. And if you're listening to us on a regular podcast channel, uh, let them know how well you like it. Uh, again, listen to our sponsor message. They've got some great tools out there. You can take a look at their website and they'll help you out as a CISO. 
And finally, Jim, if somebody needs help setting up a threat management program and they wanted to reach out to you or uh, anything about your team, how would they contact you? Well, they can either use my email address. I'll spell it. It's C-H-M-A-R-G-A-U at AOL.com. Or they can call me. My cell number is 703-282-5509. And I'd be happy to discuss an insider threat program with them. I can also put you in touch with some of my colleagues whom I respect greatly. And we can jointly look at this, do a seminar, do whatever you want. We can basically come in and look to see how you could take best practices, what you could do to improve things. So anybody, feel free to just contact me either through email or through my cell phone number, 703-282-5509. Well, Jim, thanks again on behalf of our audience for your time and for audience. Until next time, stay safe out there.